joining us again. Today, we're going to continue our micro tour series and have a little peek inside the reception room. Now, you can um, see a little bit of the reception room behind me, and you might notice it has a very different feel than the last space we looked at, the uh, hall, which is supposed to be very big and grand and impressive. But when you go through the spaces of Lippitt House, you would see that um, all the spaces in the house are gendered, male and female, and that's dictated by the types of activities that would happen in those spaces, as well as the people that would um, kind of inhabit those spaces, um, who's, who was appropriate for each space. And when we're here in the reception room, this is most definitely um, would have been considered a female space, a woman's space, and that would have been reinforced with the design, both um, through the decorative painting that continues here, lots of floral motifs that would be identified as a, as a, as a motif um, identified with women, but also through the artwork. You can see behind me that most of the sitters in the paintings here in the reception room feature female um, sitters. So that really just kind of reinforces the, the idea. So having said that this is a female space, this would be the primary social space for Mary Ann Lippitt. So as an upper class woman um, that had uh, connections to a family with not only um, uh, wealth, but also political connections, Henry Lippitt, two-term Rhode Island governor from 1875 to 1877, Mary Ann would have a lot of responsibilities to kind of keep up the family connections and reputation within the larger community. And a lot of that would happen here in this space in the reception room. This is where Mary Ann Lippitt would have entertained guests, mostly female guests. Um, this is um, a, a very big um, social responsibility in her journal. She actually kept very extensive records of all the people that she entertained here at Lippitt House as well as the people that invited her to take calls on, on them as well. And this is a way at a time when women like Mary Ann Lippitt could not vote, this is still an opportunity to exercise political power. Um, this is a great story that we're really trying to feature and highlight um, this year in 2020 being the 100th anniversary of the passage of the 19th Amendment commemorating women's suffrage in the United States. And so even though she couldn't vote, um, um, in private um, areas like this reception room is a way where Mary Ann could exert um, political power. Now, as the women's suffrage movement in the 19th century kind of gains um, a lot of momentum and a lot of enthusiasm, um, the suffragists, the men and women who um, believed in the extension of voting rights to women, held lots of public events, you know, lectures and debates and parades, all to try to advance their cause. But in the time that Mary Ann was living here at the Lippitt House, um, the Lippitt family was very uh, conservative and did not believe in extension, extending suffrage rights to women. So they were anti-suffrage, or antis as they're frequently called. And the antis believed that um, the political world um, was a public world for men and that women should confine their influence to more kind of reform efforts, um, or focus on women and children, and that should all be based at, at the home. So using the reception room, I wonder, um, what kind of political conversations happened in this space? Um, it was um, advocated that women should try to um, convince other women of the um, anti-message. I'm working one-on-one, -on -one, talking to friends, talking to family members, and I wonder what kind of conversations were had here in this space when Mary Ann was living at, at the Lippitt House. So uh, thanks so much for, for joining us. I'm glad that you got a little peek inside, and then we'll hope you see you again soon and join us for another video. Take care.